Okay, folks, you had to pick, obviously, between this and Betsy DeVos. Uh, I've dealt with scheduling uh, ministers and secretaries, and basically, I'm sure that they had no choice. She just said, I can speak now. So here's, here it is, and thank you for taking a little time to, to hear about data and education. Uh, data is the new currency. Uh, the CEO of Lloyd's Insurance was telling me recently that 84% of the assets in the S&P are now intangible. It's quite remarkable. 10 years ago, it was the opposite. Only less than 15% of the assets of the S&P were intangible. So we're seeing a massive shift of value in the world. The value is moving to data. Platforms that manage data are becoming the asset of the 21st century. So it's all about data. It's all about data. Uber is all about data. There's nothing else in Uber but data. And through that, they were able to build a platform that, frankly, uh, you pended the life of a half billion people who drive cars and lorries and trucks. This is the power of data that we're living through today. I'm going to spend a few minutes with you to talk about data in the education sector and how uh, it affects that. And just for background, I thought I'll give you just uh, kind of the 101 of the data infrastructure of the world. Um, data in the world moves through layers. The bottom layer is the infrastructure layer. All of you are familiar with that because you sign up for AT&T accounts and Verizon accounts. They are the guys who run the green layer. The green layer today has about 77,000 networks in the planet that actually move data for everybody. Who controls the green layer? The companies that own it and the regulators that regulate them. So the SEC and the ministries of telecommunications around the world regulate and control that green layer. The next layer is a layer most of you shouldn't know about, but that's what makes the 77,000 networks and the 21.9 billion things connected to these networks look like the internet. What makes the internet one internet is this orange layer. Uh, the orange layer is called the logical infrastructure of the data of the world. It is run by an organization called ICANN. ICANN manages all the names, the domain names, the IP numbers, the protocol parameters, all the things that make the internet one data layer for the world. Uh, as a footnote, I ran ICANN for four years as its president. So I had the responsibility to ensure that the internet stays as one internet for the world by maintaining that layer. And we had some difficulties at some point after Snowden where in fact uh, some governments you can figure out who they are around the world. We're actually asking for that orange layer to be broken in two or in three. Uh, Angela Merkel, after she found out her phone was being listened to, if you recall, uh, called for a European internet. What she meant by that was to create two orange layers, completely separate. So if you typed IBM.com in Europe, typed IBM.com in the USA, you'd go to different machines. It didn't happen. That's another story for another day. But today, the internet remains one internet for the world. Now, on top of these two layers, everything we do on the internet happens. All the data we move for, from the education to entertainment to all the things we do happen on top of that. Now, who controls that layer? Who do you think controls that top layer? Nobody. By design, this top layer of the internet is completely what we call multi-stakeholder controlled. Some companies control pieces of it, some governments control pieces of it, some individuals now have enormous power over it. And I think what's changing that blue layer, which is the life of the internet and the data world we live in, is this uh, box there on the left, the third from the left, called Internet of Things. How many people here know about IoT, high level? You know what IoT is, okay? Today we have about uh, 20 to 30 billion IoT devices. These are things that talk to the internet. My iWatch, that's one, one thing, right? Uh, now people are installing uh, heart uh, 
uh, heart elements that talk to the internet. HP just released an, a knee that talks to the internet. So there are different things that talk. You know, the uh, Nest, if you remember, the, the thermostat talks to, the, that's a thing. Estimates are that by 2030, there will be 100 trillion things that talk to the internet. That's according to a study by Stanford and Fairchild. Which means we're gonna be living in a highly connected world. And the data that moves between all these pieces becomes essentially the new currency of the 21st century. And it, 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 was, it was spot on when President Xi of China said this here in the opening of the Davos meeting in Switzerland that data is the fuel of the 21st century. And that's how the Chinese are viewing it. And I know we are because most of the infrastructure that built all of this has started right here in our country. And we still have a huge hand in how this is shaped. Now, end of my one-on-one -on -one lesson on kind of the data layers, let's come back to data in education. This is a vast discussion and uh, I teach this at Harvard and at Oxford in England, so I'm just gonna keep it to 20 minutes about the values, the areas where data will affect education. The first is data analytics. You hear a lot about that. There are many companies even here at GSV talking about this. The second is artificial intelligence. Uh, and the third I'll touch on is blockchain, okay? So quickly, data analytics. Data analytics is the ability to now understand down to the person exactly what are the uh, measures that will move this person to do things differently. So I'll give you an example. There's a, uh, there's a study that just came out on how the Trump campaign used data analytics to narrow exactly how to target messages to individuals. So on the left is the model used in the campaigns of the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, which we call demographics, right? Uh, pardon me, geographics, where they say, okay, we see people all the same if they live in LA. Then uh, the Obama campaign really used demographics very well, where they could target women who are college educated, who live in Cincinnati with certain messages. Now, because of data analytics, the Trump campaign used what we call psychographics, which is the, the one on the end there, where we actually can tell exactly what an individual who lives on a block in Cincinnati, what messages will be good for them to move them. And if you don't know enough about what, uh, how they use this, go online and look up a company called Cambridge Analytica. That's the company where Steve Bannon was on the board and actually he brought them to actually manage the analytics for the Trump campaign, allowing them to get down to the individual and find out what that individual wants to hear in order to sway their vote. Now there's nothing new in this. We've been doing this in supermarkets for the longest time. We just hadn't done it in politics. But I am on the board of a company who does it every day in supermarkets. They literally know that if you're picking up Cheetos and Lipitor, that there is a connection there. And they study that and actually can track this for you. So lots of these analytics have been happening in different fields. They just happened in politics. This is the first year we did it. But I think it's coming to education now where we actually can see an educational model where we are building solutions that are student-centric. We still build programs at universities like they did in Bologna 500 years ago at the first university. You know, professors sit down and they decide this is a good program, it will produce the right kids. And of course, I mean, having been in the cyberspace, uh, with the responsibility for that orange layer I showed you, I can tell you most programs producing cyber security uh, degrees are old by the time the kid is out of the school. I mean, this environment is moving so fast that programming things uh, for, for several years and then getting them into a program, then putting kids through them, by the time they're done, this is old news. So we need to move to a model that is far more focused on how do we get this individual to actually fulfill this role in society and how can we build the educational model around them. If you think about it, what did Uber really do? Uber made the, the rider in charge of building a transportation system based on their need. 
So you go and say, I want to go from here to here. That's the type of car I want. And I want drivers with so many stars. And the whole transportation system becomes rider-centric. This will happen in education, where the student will say, I want to go to this four-year degree, but I want to take these three online classes, and I want to take this CBE thing so I can learn on my own pace. And the system will have to adapt to that, because it doesn't today. The system assumes everybody will go through the old Bologna system of a term education. This is changing. Let me talk about artificial intelligence. We're all afraid of artificial intelligence. Most studies show that humans are getting a little bit worried about that space. It's a space that, frankly, is terribly marketed because we make it sound like it will replace our brains. It won't. It will replace some of our activities. There is no question about it. And I'll show you an example of how we're doing this in the education sector. But by no means it will replace uh, most human judgment. It will replace some logical human judgment. But I think we could all agree most human judgment is often not just logical. It includes a logical component, but it includes a lot of other things. Now, let me show you an example of that. This is a company on whose board I'm also uh, uh, serving now that has built the first expert system that actually is student-centric. It's around the student. The company is called Vocado. And they basically allow then each institution to look at the student and make the academic model super flexible and then make the funding model super flexible and manage all the student financing in real time. It's integrated to the government systems. It's integrated to the student portals. It's integrated to the institutional systems. And as that student is learning, taking a class, dropping a class, failing a class, uh, changing programs, the system in real time is recalculating the optimal student financing package for them. Federal, state, private, mixing them, and redoing all of this in real time and actually managing this for them. This is only possible through expert system technology. Otherwise, it, it's immensely complex. Today, this is done by humans who sit down and actually have to calculate this. And it's very, very complex to do that. And most systems that exist today from the leading vendors, whether it's uh, Oracle or Lucene or so on, are generally built around the Bologna model, a term model, traditional model. They're not designed to accommodate any academic model, any learning speed, and therefore, uh, in many ways, the academic model is hampered by their lack of flexibility. I will skip a couple of slides in the interest of time, but these are all analytics and artificial intelligence activities. Let me focus on blockchain. Again, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. How many people here can describe blockchain to their mother or to somebody else? Somebody, what is a blockchain? Do you need the kind of basic? You can? OK, so you help me out if I fail. But I found this picture to make it very easy. So blockchain is essentially the concept of shifting from a centralized ledger to a distributed ledger. Now, many of you have heard of Bitcoin. And I hope you own some of it, because you've seen it rise in the last few months. It's now tripled and quadrupled for some of us who own some of it. But Bitcoin is an actual currency that is only possible because it's built on a blockchain. So blockchain is almost, think of it as the operating system that enabled an application called Bitcoin. But let's focus on the operating system and how it could be used uh, in education. So let me explain a little further the difference between the two. Today, most ledgers, databases that contain registries of information, are actually highly centralized. Think about the simplest one that we all deal with. In your county or in your city, there is a land or house recorder uh, for the county. In Los Angeles, we have the county recorder, where if you own land or you own a house, someone registers it there. It's a centralized ledger that is a clearinghouse between the sellers and the buyers and the escrow companies. All of them deal with that. But the master record of who owns a house or a land is centralized. And these people keep it. Come now the concept of blockchain, which says, actually, we don't need a centralized ledger. We could have a highly distributed ledger using all the computers out there that are part of that network. 
And therefore, when you and I buy or sell something between us, those compu computers manage an immutable record, an unchangeable record that is checked by all the computers in real time, maintaining the, the uh, uh, integrity of this database without having a centralized model. So now let's translate it to practice. Honduras had a major problem in that there was a lot of corruption causing the centralized land management authority. You'd go to sell your land and tell you, sorry, somebody actually bought your land last year. What do you mean? I didn't sell it. So there was a lot of corruption and issue. So they switched to a blockchain. Now in Honduras, there is no land management office in the government. It's a machine that is actually maintaining all those records, right? Banks, Switzerland just announced that one of the top executives of UBS is leaving to set up the first Swiss blockchain currency office because they think soon there will be a global currency that will be managed by a blockchain. Because what are banks doing in central banks? They're ledgers. They're saying your account has this much. If you give Fadi this amount, we'll take it off your account, we'll put it in his account. That's all it is. And that's why all the banks in New York just gathered and are building a private blockchain because they believe this will completely change the way money changes hands in the future. Let's come to education. How could this be useful for education? I'll give you a very simple example. Records, student records. <laughs> when employers go to hire somebody, can you send me your records, please? Can you call all the schools, get your records? Are these authentic? Imagine if there was a central database managed by machines where every student record is recorded by these machines. So when an employer wants to go check where did Fadi go to school and what grades he got or what jobs he had, the machines are maintaining this and it's immutable, it's unchangeable. So we could have a centralized way to manage that. We could do the same thing for funding because right now one of the big issues when we provide financial aid to students is did they go to another school? Did they transfer from another place? What uh, the 150% rule, for those of you who are financial aid fluent, there's a million rules that make it very complex to actually dispense aid. And you need to get data from many places because you can, before you can tell the student, here it is, that's your package, that's what we're willing to give you. And it's compliant with government rules as well as private rules. Blockchain could be very helpful in that space as well. And Vocado is experimenting with this as we speak. So I just gave you three quick examples to give you a sense of the data revolution and how it's coming to us. Uh, I frankly think that the data platform economy is here. I'll give you an example. Monsanto no longer sells seeds. And if you, you guys know about Monsanto. What do they do? They sell seeds. They no longer sell seeds. They sell yields. They're actually going to farmers and say, here are the seeds for free. But let's partner with you and we'll share in the yields. If your yield goes up, we'll take a piece of this. Wow, how can Monsanto do this? This is complicated. So when I asked the CEO of Monsanto, he said it's very simple. It's a data issue. So now we have satellites watching the land of the farmer. We, can, we have sensors in the ground sending us data about the composition, the chemical composition, the water composition. We're combining all this data with data with other partners like uh, John Deere and so on. And through data, they're able to actually partner with the farmer and they call this the data platform uh, for agricultural space. Uber is a data platform for the transportation space. Airbnb is a data platform for the lodging space. And that's coming to education. It's going to be here, where we will have data platforms that actually are student-centric, not school-centric. Because students are going to go to a menu and get data from wherever they need, get, pardon me, learning from wherever they need to actually reach their goals. We hear at this conference of so many people saying we have a new platform to do this. The degree is dead. I heard this twice yesterday. It's finished. Now people can learn as they need, a la carte, uh, according to their timeline. Yes, all of this might and will happen. I don't think it will erase the degree, but learning will become far more of a, of a complex portfolio rather than one thing. The question is, how do you actually finance all of that? And this is where these technologies 
will be very useful. And how do you make sure a kid who's at Gainesville getting a BS in something, and then in the summer is in Miami at his home getting a class at Miami-Dade Community College, and then uh, taking something online because they found a great little course at some university that they need. How do you then track this kid's financial aid, for example, or their records? So a data platform, a data-centric educational model is coming, and I think it's not far from where we are today. Um, so from degrees to yields, I think we heard a lot also at this conference. I think there will be a moment when we will see the, uh, the consumer of the talent and the seeker of the talent connected. That's the vision that I want to share with you. And uh, people who watch Uber either with disdain or with glee, but let me just point to the glee part. <laughs> What Uber did is connect the rider to those who are willing to drive them. And they didn't think of everything in between. They said, it will sort itself. It will happen. They gave the rider access to those who will drive them. And the companies in the middle, who are these? Taxi companies, car companies, transportation companies, Hertz, Avis, all these guys were caught completely off guard. And that someone says, I'll connect the rider straight to those who are willing to, ride, uh, to drive them. Now, I think in education, what will happen is the manager who's seeking a talent or a portfolio of talents will put that out on the data platform. Say, I'm looking for two guys who know CAD, who have three years of experience, who may understand haptics. They will list that. And the data platform will find these people. And if they're not ready, if they're missing one of the talents, then Educational institutions will step in and say, hey, Joe is almost there. He needs two classes and an internship. We can supply this and move Joe across the line. And employers, by the way, are showing us already that they're ready to finance that. They're saying, fine, if Joe will take these two classes and then is ready to come and fill this position I have, I'm willing to, uh, to uh, invest in this. This is all possible. The technology to do this is here today. It's major transformational change. And we saw that in other sectors. It hasn't yet happened in our sector, but it will. I think we are at the point where we need to move from degrees to yields. In fact, I don't have the percentage, but someone, someone told me that a large number of job positions, descriptions coming out of tech companies or digital companies like GE, are less and less listing the degree as a requirement. The degree is almost disappearing as a requirement. They're looking for certain talents, certain a portfolio of knowledge and activities to, to bring people on board. So, data, our new world. Any questions to me? Any, anyone has any clarifications or additions or better, better explanations of how blockchain works? Happy to hear them. Sir. Yes. Yes. Look, in the 90s, when we were building some of these platforms, I was with IBM at the time, uh, the need for standards was higher because the systems were far more rigid than they are today. The data structures were rigid. Now, today, we are much more flexible. We're able to actually exchange data across platforms and taxonomies and structures a lot better because both because of computing capabilities, but also because of much smarter languages we're writing these things in. Having said that, basic data standards are still missing in the education sector. Uh, the company I showed you earlier, Vocado, which does things in the financial aid and student financing state, created actually a basic language called SAFI, Student Academic Financing Information uh, Language. It's kind of a protocol that starts standardizing how system-to-system -system data exchanges happen. Uh, in the 90s, I was also the founder of RosettaNet, which was the first body that actually started saying, how do we in supply chains normalize and standardize XML messages between machines? And so we're doing a little bit of that now in education. It actually makes integration of systems a lot faster. 
and it's, it's actually quite needed. So thanks for pointing that out. The more we do that, the better, but it's no longer as necessary as it used to be. Any other questions to me, sir? I have to mention open system. Yes. 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 Spot on, by the way. So uh, I think the data revolution is, is in many ways disintegrating the high concentration of data with big, powerful players. Now, on the consumer side, that's not happening. Google, Facebook, these guys are actually becoming huge aggregators of data. I mean, huge. I don't think some of, some of us don't even see how big it is. And uh, just as a fact, the surface of the World Wide Web that we all see is a fifth of the World Wide Web. Four fifths of the World Wide Web, most of us don't see. Google actually is all over the fifth, five fifth. And so they have visibility to massive amounts of data. On the business to business side, there is no such concentration. And I'm with you that the more we provide platforms, especially in a space like education, which is a mission-driven space, that are open, that have transparency rules about in and out data, and that protect the students' data, because students are also very vulnerable. Unlike, I mean, even adults are vulnerable, but students are even more vulnerable, especially if it has to do with financial aid. You go to the student and you say, listen, just give me this data and I'll give you access to more scholarships. Oh, yeah, have it. And then they don't realize how much they're exposing. So the rules and the ethical framework by which data is collected and shared need to be uh, in place and very quickly. One of the projects I'm doing in, in Europe is to define the ethical rules around data use for health data. And I'll give you an example. Uh, so today, I have data about my health coming out of my iWatch into the cloud. Uh, the data about my last clinical test at my doctor is probably also through my provider in the cloud. Uh, sensors around me are collecting data about me and sending it to the cloud. All that data is going to aggregators like, say, IBM Watson, who are then cooking all that data and saying, you know what, Fadi will probably not have a lifespan of more than two years. Okay, who owns that piece of data? Who can they share it with? What are the ethical rules around that? Can they give it to my wife? Can I give it to my doctor, to my insurer? None of this is clear on the health side and not on the education side either. So we are starting some efforts actually at Harvard between the Harvard uh, government school, Kennedy School and the education school to start building some ethical frameworks on sharing educational data that are open, transparent, and frankly, ethical. I'm out of time. Thank you for staying when you had a much more attractive Betsy DeVos to listen to. I hope this was worth your time.